Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell, and it is my pleasure to have one of the smartest real estate minds on the planet on today's call. We have a great pleasure of hearing from John England, and today's presentation is about secrets of self-storage investing. And what's great about these weekly webinars is to be able to mastermind and learn things. So I know a lot about real estate investing, but I have never done a self-storage deal. And I went and found the smartest self-storage guy that I could and asked him to teach us all about uh, his craft uh, of self-storage investing. I know that you can make a lot of money in that field. And so today's call is really designed to see you know, um, whether self-storage is a good investment for you. We're going to talk about some commercial real estate basics to really make sure everyone has a basis of vocabulary so that this conversation will make sense to you. We're going to talk about why self-storage in the first place, why that could or could not be a good investment. And the idea is uh, a good investment is an investment that's good for you. And so you might look at a deal today and say, wow, that person made a million dollars. I want to do that or that I should invest in that. And that isn't necessarily true because every investment has a different source of resources, a different kind of outcome and a different level of stress associated with it. it requires a different skill set a different timing, et cetera. And so the goal for you as an investor is to identify those types of investment opportunities consistent with your assets and your objectives as an investor. So really, uh, you know, self-storage is great, but it might not be great for you, right? Or it might be great for you. We're going to find out today. We're also going to talk about how to spot a good deal. And John's got some really compelling case studies to go uh, to talk about. This is a little bit of a slide about me. Most of the people on the call today know a bit about my background. Uh, former high school band director, I became a self-made millionaire, multimillionaire through the vehicle of real estate investing. Um, I'm an investor, a developer, a broker, and my favorite thing is teaching. I'm a teacher at heart, and I really love sharing ideas behind financial literacy and how to help the average, ordinary, working American go from their job to financial independence through the vehicle of real estate. And hopefully, if we hang out together long enough, uh, you'll be able to, to become financially free. Our guest today... I am really, really excited about. I met John Anglin about 18 months ago through an organization called the Society of Exchange Counselors, which is one of the most exclusive and prestigious creative real estate organizations on the planet. And uh, John has the uh, prestigious honor of being a counselor, a member of the Society of Exchange Counselors which is a huge honor. He's also a CCIM, which is a Certified Commercial Investment Member. If you see CCIM designation on after someone's name, you know that they are a credible commercial real estate broker. It's a very difficult designation to earn, and congratulations uh, to John for having earned that, uh, that broker. Uh, John's an active investor. He not only brokers properties, but he owns properties, and he also puts together uh, partnerships to go buy uh, properties together. And so if I, you were all in the room, I'd say let's give a great round of applause for our guest speaker today, John England. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. It's great to be here. It's great to, great to have you. So before we get into the content, we do this every time, and it's a big disclaimer. We're going to talk a lot about investing. We're going to talk about tax. We might talk about uh, investing ideas, but this is not legal tax or investment advice. If you seek that type of advice, please go get representation from an appropriately licensed professional. Although John and I are both real estate brokers, there is no agency relationship created through this educational program. If you're looking for agency on acquiring or selling an asset, I'm sure that you can talk to us and we can figure out some way uh, to get you the services that you need. This is an educational only event. There's nothing for sale. There is no uh, tax or legal advice. And if we are all in agreement, then let's keep going. Let's do. This is a really good slide that I uh, really shows the difference between pure return on investment 
and all of the things that go into make a return on investment. Most people would just say the ROI is profit divided by capital invested. And that isn't quite true, right? Because we want to annualize that to make sure that it under, it's understood. So somehow you, you create an annualized number for that ROI. But then there's also the hassle involved with an investment. Real estate is not hassle-free. You know, I, 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 my brand is hassle-free cash flow investing. And it's because the, the brand, a lot less hassle than what you're doing right now, dot com, was, was a little bit too long. <laughs> So our goal is to minimize the hassle while maximizing the profit that comes out. I like self-storage, but one of the things that's a big disclaimer up front is it can be kind of a pain in the neck because self-storage is part business and part investment, right? There's ways to own self-storage through a group investment or a syndication. And if that's something that you're interested in, I'm sure John or I could help connect you to uh, very passive opportunities in uh, in syndication or partnerships, if that's something that you're interested and qualified to do. Um, but the idea of getting the most for your money with the least amount invested is what we're after as real estate investors. Let's go over a couple of vocabulary words, which are going to make the rest of the presentation more powerful. These are the ways that we make money in real estate. One is cash throw off. Other people call it cash flow. So the cash throw off from rental income is what you get to keep after all the expenses are paid. Cash throw off is not the same as net operating income. Uh, net operating income is assuming there's no debt. Cash throw off is what you get to keep after debt. Equity growth from loan amortization is the portion of what your tenants pay goes to make your loan smaller so we can make money in real estate by our tenants paying off of our debt that's a good thing if you pay off your loan that's not for profit that's just recapitalization or putting money in but if your tenants pay off your loan that's part of your profit tax savings from depreciation uh that means that you can lower the tax obligation the income tax obligation on the money that you make through tax deferral, through depreciation, or also through uh, 1031 exchange and other tax benefits of owning income property or investment property. Equity growth from appreciation. Now, when you're investing in houses, that just means I bought a house for X and it went up to 120% of X because it just happened because the comparable sales went up, people were willing to pay more. In commercial real estate, we call this cap rate compression where the income stayed the same, but people were willing to pay more to get that same amount of income. And so that means the cap rate went down and the value or the price went up. And so that's a, a, a way that we can make money through real estate. Right now, cap rates are unseasonably high. Cap rates are way above where they should be. So if you're buying property now, commercial property, it's possible that just the world gets a little bit more rosy and people pay more to own that same income stream and the prices of commercial real estate could potentially go up simply because of cap rate compression. Something I could add to that too is part I think that's involved with cap rate compression is the cost of funds to borrow. So if your interest rate is lower and you can borrow uh, money uh, che cheaper than usual, you typically can pay or willing to pay more for an asset. Mm -hmm. So that could potentially be a downside or a mitigating factor, risk factor to today's market, because while cap rates are very high, interest rates are very low. So one of the questions is what happens when interest rates go up? Are cap rates going to go up further because interest rates went up or will there be some type of equilibrium between uh, cap rates and interest rates? Great point. Yeah, no, nobody knows. If, if anyone exactly. of our callers knows, has their crystal ball out, give us a call. We would like to know. <laughs> um, the other way we make equity in real estate is from rent increases because the value of the property is a multiplier of the rent. And so if a property has one additional dollar of net operating income at a 10 cap rate, that property is actually worth $10 more. And so it's a multiplier. If you can find a way to get that property to produce more income, 
you can make a lot of money in equity because of that income uh, increase. Sometimes that's because you've increased the rents or you reduced expenses. And John is going to have a, uh, a lot of ideas for us on that. Self storage has a lot of ways to increase your rent and decrease income in the facility. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we are getting some questions in from our audience. And I really encourage you that if you do have a question, one of the benefits of attending live is you can type that question into the chat box uh, of the GoToWebinar control panel. And you can send that question uh, to us. And if the question is relevant to what we're talking about at the time, we'll answer it right away. And if the question is just a little bit of a divergence, then we'll get to your questions at the very end of the presentation or we can get to your questions um, just one-on-one -on -one after the presentation. So I really encourage everyone, the moment you have a question, don't be shy, type it in, send it to us, and we will get, uh, get to those questions. So here we go. Um, arbitrage. John was talking about this a little bit earlier, where you can borrow money at ridiculously low interest rates right now. And one of the fundamental investing rules behind hassle-free cash flow investing is we teach that your cap rate should be greater than your interest rate. So if you borrow money, I'm sorry, let me say it a different way. If you earn 8% and it costs you 5% for your money, you're making a 3% spread on the bank's money. That's good. Your profit return is going to go up exponentially because you're earning a return on the bank's money, right? If you could get 100% financing and pay 5% of your money and you could make an 8% profit, well, first of all, you have infinite returns. And the second is how much money would you like to borrow? Um, all of it, as much as I can get. If you flip that sign around and you, you start investing where the interest rate is higher than your cap rate, that means the more money you borrow, the less profit you're making. And so when you're looking at the use of leverage, it's really important to realize that leverage is a tool or like a knife, it can cut both ways. It can be beneficial in preparing your food or it could cut you and it could be painful. And so when you are using leverage, when you are using the bank's money, just be very mindful that you're doing it in a, in a positive arbitrage situation. One of the great things about self-storage is the cap rates tend to be high and the interest rates on the debt tend to be low and we can get a good spread between those two. Um, some other asset classes, that's not true, right? If you wanted to go you know, buy stocks on margin, first of all, there's usually not enough income to cover the cost of borrowing. And so you're upside down. Your, your cap rate is lower than your interest rate, you're negatively arbitraged. In real estate, we want to be positively arbitraged. Another way that we can create equity growth is from lease renewal. If we get longer term leases, people feel more confident in that income and so the cap rate is lower. Um, that's maybe not as relevant in self-storage, but it's a fundamental of, um, of investing, that, that those longer leases produce a higher, uh, a lower cap rate. People are willing to pay more for those long-term leases. In self-storage, potentially that's why cap rates are higher because most of your tenants are, are shorter term leases. Another way we make money in real estate is equity growth from increase in tenant or property quality. John's gonna be talking about later today how to take a property and maybe improve the quality of the property or improve the quality of your tenant mix or maybe in this case, unit mix. He'll be talking about unit mix, which is um, the types of units that make up your property because that's changing their tenant quality. And the stronger your tenants are, people are willing to pay a premium for that tenant. You know, For example, if you were to buy Joe's Coffee Shop or you were to buy a property lease to Starbucks, people are gonna pay a huge premium to own a property lease to Starbucks over Joe's Coffee Shop. And so that changes the property value. You know what, it just in theory, if you could buy a property that was a coffee shop leased to Joe's and you bought it for X, and then you just changed it to a Starbucks, 
you're probably going to be assuming the income stayed the same. You're probably going to sell that property for two, maybe three times more simply by changing it from a non-credit tenant to a very high credit tenant. Um, forced equity from improved tenancy, meaning let's just get the occupancy up because the more tenants there are paying you, that means your income goes up and your price, your, your, the value of your property goes up. The other thing is we can develop, right? You can add more square footage to a property and that square footage um, can produce more income, which makes the property worth more, makes the price go up. And so that was a great kind of just precursor introduction to the world of commercial real estate. And now I'd love to hear what John has to say about how to apply some of those concepts into the world of self-storage. Thank you, David. Well, self-storage is uh, an asset class that I got familiar with about four to five years ago. Um, I met a lot of people that were very successful in this space and, uh, you know, talking with them. There's several of them in CCIM and the Society of Exchange Counselor Network. And so meeting with them and understanding why they like the investment got me intrigued and that then I started working with the investors out there and brokering them and helping them find opportunities. And so um, I've learned from some great people and hopefully people on this webinar find what we have to say uh, valuable. And feel free to ask questions as we come up. The Self Storage Association uh, is the national association for self storage owners. They're actually having a conference in Las Vegas next week but they have a very good fact sheet that they present and it gives you some thumbnails on the industry. It's certainly one of the fastest growing commercial real estate sectors. There are just under 50,000 primary self storage facilities in the United States, which is unbelievable. Um, a lot of people feel like they drive around and they see the public storages and the, the really large REITs and they think that they are dominating the market, but in fact, the top five storage companies only own just under 10%, which I think is uh, interesting. Now, the, the largest operators are public storage, extra space storage, sovereign, just Uncle Bob's. You store it, those are the real estate investment trusts. And then U Haul is publicly traded, but a non read. And they're the top five that have about almost 10% of the market. The rest, and I spend a lot of time in this space, uh, the tw there's 22,000 small business entrepreneurs who own and operate just one facility. So that tells me that there's a lot of opportunity for investors who are interested to getting in to this business and finding that um, they call them moms and pops, the mom and pop self storage opportunity and making an acquisition. New construction is, has gone down dramatically. There's only been 450 new facilities that came online in 2010 and 2011. Uh, this is as compared to the development peak in 04 and 05 when there was about 8,694 facilities were developed. So this tells me that most people have stopped developing and they've gone into acquisition mode. So um, the industry itself is, is kind of reached an equilibrium from a development standpoint, but everybody's looking for good solid assets that they can acquire. On the growth of the industry, it took the self-storage industry 25 years to build its first billion square feet and then it added its second billion square feet in just eight years. So that tells me that the industry is robust and it's, it's expanding and it's accepted. Also from a customer standpoint, 10% of U.S. households currently rent a self-storage unit, which is an increase from 6% of U.S. households in 1995. So, I don't know, when you think 6% to 10%, that's not a huge jump, but when you consider there's 110 million U.S. households in the United States, that's that extra 4% is a lot of people. Some advantages of self-storage, and these are all true, uh, there are have lower maintenance. Uh, when you're comparing this to an apartment complex, you don't have any toilets to fix. Nothing leaks. You don't have to, when a tenant moves out, you don't have to repaint the walls and tear out the carpet and fix holes in the wall. Um, you literally grab a room and you sweep it out and it's ready to be rented. So that's a very attractive thing if you're renting out space. How, what do you have to do to prepare the space for the next tenant? And self-storage 
you need a broom and maybe some bug and weed killer. There's steady cash flow, which is attractive. So if we have 300 units and uh, it's 85% occupied, if one or two tenants moved out, I'm not going to lose any sleep because you know I have 300 spaces. If I had a fourplex and two tenants move out, I would be a little nervous because I'm 50% occupied overnight all of a sudden and maybe I'm having trouble paying for some of my expenses. So the scalability of having multiple units is something that uh, banks like. Uh, it makes me sleep at night. I think it makes storage owners sleep at night. And you're always going to have people moving in and moving out, but having multiple units allows for steady cash flow. Lower operating expenses. Um, typically, for, when you compare against apartments and retail and shopping centers and office buildings, self-storage on their expense side of things tend to be have lower operating expenses. So they're gro as a percentage of gross revenue, uh, typically the expenses run from 30% to 45% on the high end. And I've seen expenses in the 20s, believe it or not. This is your uh, owner operator that rents the units himself. He sweeps them out himself. He fixes them. He mows the lawn and scoops the block. And um, he then pays his bills and puts the rest in his pocket. So in that scenario, he's going to have very low expenses. If you look on the flip side of things, I've seen facility owners that have really fat expenses and pull a lot of fees out of them, and that's how they operate. So it's just really dependent on the area and the property. But banks like these self-storage because um, typically, like we talked about, having lower operating expenses and steady cash flow, uh, they tend to have lower loan default uh, histories as an asset class. So that's a good thing, obviously. They, these are typically financeable. Month-to-month -month leases, David touched on a little bit regarding um, why it's good to have a long-term lease, but there's also benefits with self-storage having month-to-month -month leases. Uh, with month-to-month -month leases, you can change the lease next month if you wanted to. If you wanted to increase your rents, you can. You send out a letter and say, rent's going up. If your property taxes get um, high from one year to the next, you can pass that through to your tenants because you have a month-to-month -month lease. If you have a problem tenant that is driving you nuts, you can send them a letter saying, I'm terminating your lease. It's a month-to-month -month agreement. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, which I think is a, certainly a benefit. And having month-to-month -month leases, I think, provides an inflationary hedge on your, the dollar. So if we have, if you were to buy a building that had a 15-year lease, I can bet, especially with the way our government has been spending money like crazy, if uh, the, the value of the dollar could be drastically different 15 years in the future than it is today. But uh, with month-to-month -month leases and having the ability and flexibility to pass through expenses and increase rents when you want to, I think that provides, um, from a long-term perspective, a good inflationary edge. One interesting thing on that topic, uh, Uncle Bob's self-storage, for example, they're a huge company they have a technology that allows them to reprice their storage units on a daily or hourly basis based upon occupancy of a particular unit type. And so they know because of their data collection and their, their market presence, how many of a certain unit type are available in a certain market at a specific moment in time. And they can say, well, we're running short on this unit size. And so the price automatically changes in the computer for all of the new uh, leases and renewing leases um, on an hourly basis. So if you come in in the morning, the price might be different that afternoon because of what uh, the occupancy rate is in the market. That's exactly true. That's, uh, that's what's really cool about this industry is um, the software out there is, is really caught up. Uh, there are all kinds of um, advantages to that, but having a month-to-month -month lease, if you're completely out of 10 by 20s and that is a very popular unit mix in your market, you can increase your rents five, ten dollars per unit by sending a letter out and most people will just pay it. They won't spend their weekend moving out to save ten dollars a month. Um, high barriers to entry, 
one of the reasons I think acquisitions of existing facilities are um, good is as I'm looking at asset classes, I like to invest in things that have uh, high barriers to entry. The cities, for example, have really started to put a lot of um, stringent protocols on new development of self-storage. They require a lot of brick, they require screen walls, and uh, some of them are multi-level, they, they need a lot of glass. The days of the old metal building with a lot of garage doors facing a highway are kind of past us. So you know if you were to buy a good 20-year-old property that's been there forever and is well occupied, if someone were to buy some land across the street from you, they're going to have to build the Taj Mahal compared to what you have and they're going to have to charge a much higher price per unit to make any kind of return. So you're protected in that high barrier to entry versus if you were an apartment owner and you bought an apartment building, there's really no guarantee that at any point in the time someone's going to build another apartment down the road from you because there's just a need for housing. Um, there are multiple profit centers aside from just renting units and I think the best managers really drill down on what can I do to squeeze additional revenue and you'll see everything from selling locks and boxes out of their retail office to offering tenant insurance they will offer truck rental services, they'll offer business fulfillment, um, they'll offer um, little post-it mail slots to offer post office, bo post office boxes for people. Uh, anything they can think of to squeeze an extra you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars a month and as we were talking about what that does on a cap rate, if by doing little things of selling boxes, renting trucks and selling insurance you can squeeze an extra thousand dollars a month in profit just by having your manager do some of those things at a 10 cap you know you just added uh, ten thousand dollars in value to your property even better so a thousand dollars a month is twelve thousand dollars a year yeah, 120 I'm sorry yeah a hundred and twenty thousand dollars by by adding a, a, a small service like uh, boxes or you when you said earlier ten dollars a month rent increase I'm sure there's someone in our audience who's like ah. Oh, 10 bucks, big deal, right? No. $10 times 100 units in your self storage is $1,000 a month times 12 is $12,000, which is $120,000 of value at a 10 cap. You know, and if you're at a 7 cap, it's even bigger, right? It might be worth $150,000, $160,000. That's correct. So that's what's neat about that. Um, and another thing too is there's a lot of third-party management providers out there for self-storage so um, you don't have to be the guy sitting in the office and renting units yourself you can hire people to do that for you and you can hire third-party management companies to oversee your investment property and you if you know that's the angle you want to go to uh, when you're looking at these deals you just have to budget accordingly for them and there's local third-party management, you know, just hiring local mom and pops, but also some of the biggest names in the industry, like Uncle Bob's, for example, they prefer not owning their own properties. They actually will manage for a, a third party. So if you have a, a high enough quality property, you can call Uncle Bob's and say, would you master manage this? They'll rebrand it. So it looks like an Uncle Bob's, it functions like an Uncle Bob's, the signage is Uncle Bob's, it is an Uncle Bob's, except for they send the percentage of the rent to you as the property owner. That's correct. That seems pretty awesome. It's like owning a Subway sandwich shop, but not ever having to show up because Subway just runs it for you. Exactly. And there's a lot of companies that do that and they're good. And typically the, uh, the third, the REITs, well, they will pull more revenue per unit out of their facilities than the uh, traditional uh, single owner operator does. They're very good. Some self storage myths. Um, a myth is that it's a passive investment. Um, it's not. It you you really need um, investors that are engaged in their business. The the ones that thrive in this industry, um, they understand that it's a business and they spend time thinking about their competition thinking about how they can differentiate themselves from their competition, what kind of um, incentives they can provide new customers, how do they can find new customers, what kind of marketing they can do on the internet. Um, 
what they need to do to continue to drive revenue. And so those people that are engaged tend to do very, very well in this business. So everything um, you just said, John, applies really to any property, right? So any exactly any real estate is not necessarily passive. It can function as a passive investment, right? So if John, you're putting together a partnership and someone, um, you say, hey, I'm gonna do all the work and you write a check, well, then one person is passive because all they did is supply the money. And then for you, it becomes active because you're actually doing all of the work. Correct, and everyone knows their roles, so. Yeah, so it, the property itself is active, but you're an individual investor could, if they like self storage, could they? They could potentially make it passive if they wanted to. They could absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the early 1980s this was probably true, but it's no longer true that if you just built a facility somewhere, customers will come and they'll come in droves and they'll find you and your your uh, complex will fill up. That's no longer the case. Um, the as we saw, how there's been two billion square feet built since the first one started in 1960s, I believe. So uh, the, there's kind of a state of equilibrium of supply and demand, and then you drill down in specific neighborhoods of specific areas of, of specific cities where you find opportunities for new development. But the days of doing no research, finding a, a, a good site and building, um, and customers finding you, those deals some, most, of the, most often don't work. Location isn't important. I think, again, at one point that might have been the case, but now location is very important. Um, if I were going to buy a facility, I would probably pay more money for a well-located facility that um, is, has, is stabilized and has some things wrong with it that can be fixed versus buying one that's 40 or 50 cents on the dollar that's hard to find um, and you have to drive past the competition to, to get to it. So. Some people get zeroed in on the value. Oh my gosh, it's for sale at half price. I can make it work. Uh, I probably would still rather buy the one on the corner. A good example in my town, uh, the, there's a self-storage facility right next to the marina. Like immediately adjacent to the marina, there's a self-storage facility. They charge twice as much rent as the self-storage that's two miles away. No kidding. And it's two miles. You would think people would drive two miles to uh, over to you know to save you know half price, but the convenience of being able to just pull your boat right out of the self storage and into the water is uh, people are willing to pay a huge premium for that location. Absolutely, um, I think it's also a myth that a mom and pop single um, store operator can't compete with the REITs. That's not true. Um, people do all the time. The REITs do a great job of driving revenue and getting people to their locations, but at the same time they have the perception, and I think they try to combat this, uh, they have the perception of being more expensive than the mom and pop operator does. So, But the mom and pop uh, entrepreneur can absolutely compete with the REITs in this business. And this is more pop culture reference, but you know why spend the effort to own a facility when you can stand in line with hundreds of people and and make more money at storage unit auctions by being the high bidder because every unit is loaded with treasure right David <laughs> I'm sure that the treasure to someone but maybe no one yeah will be for treasure it. to someone don't believe everything you see on TV the other thing is when you own a property it has attributes of an investment which are passive, right? Self storage, uh, as you see on this slide, John's saying is, you know, twenty percent business and eighty percent real estate. That means it's eighty percent of an investment. When you're going to a self storage auction or any other kind of thing, it's a hundred percent business. There's no investment involved. It's just you're actively working it. Correct. Um, the we were thinking of this slide of, you know, is this a, something that's right for you? And I don't know, does this describe you? Do you own any residential retail or other commercial real estate? Self-storage might be a great way to diversify. Um, we talked about self-storage being a business. I think you need to understand going in that it is a business. It's not a straight triple net deal. The You will have employees and sometimes that's a good thing. If you are a good motivator of people um, and you know how to 
uh, incentivize and keep people motivated, then this is a great industry because there's a lot of downtime in storage. You're kind of busy at the beginning of the month and busy at the end of the month, and there's a lot of downtime in the middle of the month. So, um, but also with employees, specifically self-storage employees, there tend to be hourly wage employees, and there's a lot of challenges that oftentimes goes with people in that industry. They have car problems and family problems, and they sometimes don't come to work. So you need to have backup plans ready for um, when things like that happen. So John, and, if I were to buy a big self storage facility and then call Uncle Bob's and say, Uncle Bob's, I want you to manage this for me. Candidly, how much time am I as the owner investing in managing my manager of the property? And that's a great question. Um, I'd say the, um, if you were to hire a third party manager, so you're taking, you're essentially taking yourself out of the hiring and firing and day to day management of your on site employee, which is a big, great thing to outsource. On the other hand, you're still managing the management company that is working for you. So if you need, if, if the property isn't performing like you'd hoped it would be, or if you feel like you're not getting the attention, um, you have the right to call and be a squeaky wheel and ask for, ask them for updated information. So I think you can be as involved as you want to be, but hiring the third party management gets you out of that um, day to day space where if something breaks, you're getting the call. Um, you just, it gives you a buffer. So it depends on some people really want to be involved with everything. And this is a great business for those people. And some people may want to be a little more passive and, and have layers of management. And you can do that with self storage. It's really, you can be tailored to what you were looking for. Mm -hmm. And that goes into the passive versus active. I think this asset um, provides, I think, both for whatever um, you're looking for. You can be very active and successful, or you can be a passive um, investor and have um, people working for you. Briefly, we'll talk about the, the three main types of self-storage facilities. They're broken down into Class A, Class B, and Class C. The Class A facilities are pretty modernized. They're year 2000 to present. Most of them are real estate investment trust or large regional op, uh, storage company owned and operated. They're primarily focused in the large urban markets. They have the retail locations. They may include other ancillary businesses like car washes, or uh, large retail storefronts to lure people in. They have a multiple video camera surveillance, door alarms, climate control. Uh, they're brick and glass structures. Some of them are multi-story. Mul yeah, multi-story. They'll have wine storage and secured fencing. It's just a Class A facility. A couple pictures of what some of them look like. This one down here, actually, um, I find it interesting. It, it looks like an office building to me. It doesn't even look like a storage facility, but it is a storage facility. And going, this is kind of what I was talking about. If I, if you buy one that's 20 years old, that's all metal and doors, and it's across the street over here, and then this person buys some land and builds this, I guarantee you he's got to charge a lot more money than you do to rent up your units. Mm -hmm. High so barriers to entry. There, there's not necessarily, you know, a class isn't better than B class because the A class comes with a price. You just have to understand what your market demands. Yeah, and that's a great point. And this is the class B properties are my favorite properties. This is what I spend most of my time brokering. This is what I spend most of my time uh, underwriting and looking at because I think there's a lot of opportunity in the B properties. Um, they're typically 1980s and even late 70s to 1990s vintage. Uh, your ownership is a combination of the mom and pop entrepreneur and the, the REITs. They're typically seasoned and there are several are location driven with freeway visibility and access. Their construction materials will be metal buildings or block buildings. Uh, they'll have secure perimeter fencing and gates and they'll have the retail uh, storefront. Some of them may even have a manager's residence on site which is an interesting component to that started in oh about 20 years ago where people felt that they needed a manager to live there and work there full time um, I don't I'm kind of indifferent to having someone do that I don't think it's a deal killer either way but it's certainly you'll see some class B properties that do have a residence on site 
and they may offer climate control as well. Class B property, this is a great Class B property as you can see. It's got freeway access, um, lots of buildings. It's got a manager's residence down here. This thing's been there forever. Um, it's probably mostly full. Everyone's driven by it. They know it's there and when they think of storage, they'll go, oh, what's that place I've driven past every week for the last 15 years of my life? Those are the ones you like. I like, the, go back to that picture and something that I see is you're right on the interstate. Look how yep. much advertising you're getting technically for free. I mean, you pay a premium for the land because it's by the interstate, but all those eyeballs just remind people that your facility is there every day. Exactly. So, and that's, like you said, you don't have to pay for that. People, and a lot of times when customers walk into offices and one of the questions managers will ask is, how'd you find me? Or what'd you, how'd you hear about me? In cases like this, probably nine out of ten will say, I've driven by you for years. Yeah, that's right. You know, in that particular property, great, you know, value add potential revenue stream might be a, a billboard or a cell phone tower, something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see a lot of those uh, billboards and cell phone towers on self-storage facilities. Your Class C properties, um, these have a lot of potential upside with them, but they're, um, I think they're, tend to be the low cost provider. They're usually really old. They're kind of in the larger, largely rural or smaller communities. They tend to be smaller facilities. Um, the construction materials, um, wood buildings, metal buildings, they'll have swing doors like you have in your house versus up and down garage doors like you think with storage. They won't have any gate or fencing around it. They'll have gravel driveways. Um, I think as time goes, most will probably have to be converted or at some point will probably become obsolete. A couple pictures of your Class C pr properties, you know, you got a nice gym right here. And, you know, this one's a nice looking property and it's probably in a smaller town. You, your customer drives up, looks at the sign, dials their phone number and the owner meets them there and rents them a unit. It's just a different model. And it's it certainly fulfills the demand, but um, I tend to prefer to have more buildings and a larger space in a bigger town. Unit sizes, typically they go from really small from 5x5 five five all the way to 10x30 and some of them can get even larger than that and they're called warehouse units. Parking is also an important component. You'll see here we have parking that's just open, they call it open air parking and then you have the covered canopy parking which is at a, obviously a premium. So with the way that HOAs are very strict now, people are not allowed to park their boat or their camper in their driveway because their HOA prohibits that. It's provided a lot more demand for parking and self-storage. And so a lot of people I see that are owners have extra land. They'll, put, they'll rock it or they'll put asphalt and stripe it. And they'll park there until the demand is justified for them to build additional buildings and because they get more per square foot renting out traditional storage than they do for parking. But it's a good space holder and you're getting revenue. Well, there's an interesting trend demographically that people are living closer together. Houses are being built on smaller pieces of land and houses themselves are getting smaller. The, the days of McMansion are past, past us. And uh, people need that extra storage either for a, a primary vehicle or a recreational vehicle or even just a place to put their, their stuff. Absolutely. Unit, and so when, you, when you're looking at um, facilities, it's really important to drill down on the unit mix. It, you, you really need to have, go back, a little of everything. You don't want to have too many 5x5s five five or too many of the large units. You want to have, you know, a good balance. So, you know, how balanced is the mix? Are all the vacancies in one size? Um, I, I looked at a deal once where the seller was telling us that he was currently at 75%, and if he just did this, this, and this to rent up the units, you'd go to 85% really quickly. And so I looked at his unit mix and discovered that most of his vacancies, almost all of his vacancies were in the five by fives. 
and uh, all of his other units were full. And it doesn't. It really didn't matter if you did the three things he told you to do. There just wasn't a demand for the five by five unit, and you couldn't modify them. It just kind of was what it was. And so that was really interesting to look at what the market was uh, telling us and what that particular facility was providing. And it told us that there just really wasn't a much upside because there wasn't any demand for those smaller units in that particular town. Two types of self-storage. Uh, you have traditional storage and climate control. Here's your climate control. Um, climate control typically gets you a 30 to 40 percent premium on the exact same unit and you're not having to pump you know traditional air conditioning like an office building. You're just keeping it warm enough and cool enough so things don't melt and things don't freeze. So just a little bit warmer than or cooler than it is outside and that's climate control. But you're paying utilities at the expense of utilities and so that's why there needs to be a premium for renting out that space. So um, it's, it's important to look at climate control and, and it certainly is a great revenue enhancer but some markets uh, really prefer traditional and the climate control sits empty so because it's that much more expensive. Tenant types, you'll have typically four types, residential tenants, commercial tenants, student and military. General trends of your tenants, the majority of your customers will be residential. They're getting clutter out of their own homes or they're moving houses or they're downsizing or they're going into an apartment and so they need storage whether for long term or temporary. Commercial tenants are great because they stay almost twice as long as residential and you tend to have less collection issues with commercial tenants. So um, it's a good balance. I think typically you'll see 10 to 30 percent of your any given facility will be commercial tenants. Most storage customers will live and work within five miles of a, of a given facility. So um, that might go to as far as 10 miles if you're on a very well located freeway with visibility and people are driving past you but general rule of thumb is five miles and we talked about the HOAs creating demand for outside storage for boats and RVs and campers and stuff. When you're evaluating a facility I think it's good to look at the size the sweet spot is or the average according to the Self Storage Association is about 45,000 square feet. I think you can go as low as 30,000 square feet and still be able to support a, a full-time manager on site. If you're getting less than that you're going to be a part-time manager or your management expense will dominate the uh, revenue. So it's good to have enough scale and size that you can support someone there renting units. The Location is very important. We talked about location. The, and that's why I put it there three times. Traffic counts, the more the better, whether it's a well-trafficked thoroughfare or it's a freeway, you want high traffic counts. Management, having a retail office versus a residence, you know, you can have either one. Sometimes you have both, but you do, the biggest thing is you do need some kind of an office presence on site. Signage and visibility, people need to see you and if, and if you can advertise that's great. Is there any land nearby that you can expand on or is there any land within the footprint of the property that you're buying that you can add more buildings? That's a good thing to think about. Drainage is water running towards your buildings or away from your buildings because if you have units that flood you won't be able to rent them. So always kind of look at drainage patterns. Same thing with traffic flow is uh, how is traffic can move within your facility? Are the bays really wide between buildings? If someone that is towing a trailer on a truck, can they uh, make turns and back out and without running into your buildings? So that's something to think about. And the unit mix, you know, diverse is what you want. Then you look at the area after you've drilled down on facility, you look at your one, three, five mile demographics. Um, you want lots of people in those demographics, so that's important. Look at the trends of the neighborhood. Um, if you're pulling statistics, is the area growing or is it shrinking? You know, what from 2000 to 2010, has it increased population or decreased? Uh, what part of town are you in? Is the town growing away from you or, or towards the subject property? 
those are things to look at. You can go meet with the planning and zoning department of the city and ask where the new housing starts are going and the new developments. They'll tell you all that stuff. Um, Owner-occupied housing versus apartment housing. It's good to have a blend of both. You don't want too heavy on either side. Competition, very important. Who's your competition? How many are in the 135 that are competing? Um, how far are they away? Are they in a better or worse location than the property you're investigating? Those are all very important key details. Do you have to drive past the competition to get to the subject property? That's not a good thing usually. You want them to drive past the property you're looking at before the competition in an ideal scenario. And sometimes there's just enough demand for everybody and that happens all the time. What's the prices of everybody's units that they're offering? Sometimes you can just walk in and shop them, say, hey, I'm looking for a 10 by 10 or a 10 by 20. What do you have? If the competition says, I'm out of 10 by 10s and I have one 10 by 20. That's interesting. Okay. And then you go to the next guy and he tells you the same thing. That probably tells me that the the um, there's a lot of demand and not enough supply. And so it's probably good to invest in, uh, in a property in that area. If they tell you the opposite, that he's got 10 of each um, unit, that would be, that'd make me a little nervous that maybe there's, this area is overbuilt. Um, and then also a good tip is verify your property taxes on the, on the property that you're investigating to s confirm that it's, the county has it assessed uh, pretty close to what the seller is offering to sell it at. Because if you're, if the county has it a million dollars and you're buying it at $2 million, at some point it's going to adjust and your taxes will probably double. When you're looking at numbers for self-storage, and David touched on this, the gross potential rent is if you rented 100% of the units at uh, with no discounts for uh, every day of the year. So that's typically an impossible thing to accomplish, but it, it gives you a benchmark of a place to start. Then you apply the vacancy factor. Typically, a stabilized occupancy is 85% in this industry. So 15% um, gives you your vacancy factor and that gives you a gross income and a lot of times it will be less than that. Sometimes you'll look at properties that are 70 percent occupied so your vacancy factor will be 30 percent in that case. Then you take out the expenses which will range between 30 and 45 percent and typically the expenses is where all the negotiation comes in. You know, hey Mr. Seller you forgot expense, this expense, that expense and this one and these things add up to this amount of money and I'm going to add that to the, my expenses, which makes my net operating income less than what you have. So that typically happens and and we can, I'll talk about expenses in the next slide. Do you have anything you want to add on this slide? Uh, really what we're trying to show is if the net operating income stays the same and the cap rate goes up, the price goes down. If the cap rate goes down and the net operating income stays the same, the price goes up. If the cap rate stays the same and the net operating income goes up, then the price would go up. And so these three numbers just work in a dance together. And when you're looking at buying property, a commercial property, as you were saying, the income is oftentimes not disputed. It's what expenses go to make up that net operating income, right? So the potential rent minus vacancy minus the expenses is the NOI. And that NOI gets heavily negotiated um, and sometimes a seller will say, my net operating income was $100,000. And you say, well, I don't think I could produce $100,000, Mr. Seller, because you were a rock star. I mean, you did all kinds of things that I am not going to do to get that $100,000. So I'm only going to you know, value the property at, say, a $90,000 um, NOI, which makes the price lower. Correct. This talks about the relationship, a cap rate, so one hundred and ten. $111,000 NOI at an 8 cap gives you, you know, a $1.387 million price at a 10 cap, $1.1 million price at a 12 cap. So obviously if you're a if you're a seller, you like to sell at this. If you're a buyer, you want to sell at that. You want to buy at that. So there's your negotiation typically and we can talk about why that is with this slide. So the cap rate is based on an investor's confidence that the income is going to continue. And so there's all kinds of 
variables that go into determining the cap rate and it's highly discretionary. So if you're looking at buying uh, a self-storage unit, the cap rate is going to change from market to market and all of the other variables that go into determining the cap rate for that property. And really your best bet is to just talk with the knowledgeable uh, broker uh, who specializes in self-storage. I mean, you might have more success talking to an out-of-town self-storage expert who's going to give you better information than a local broker who specializes in apartments, right? The, the, the self-storage industry is uh, very specialized, and if you want to get into that, you may not have a self-storage expert in every town. You may have to go to a couple towns over to get someone who really understands the self-storage industry. That's true. And, you know, most people that broker self-storage facilities, they have large databases of uh, sales comparables. And so they can explain why this particular property sold for that cap rate and, and why it's different than this one, even though from looking at it, they're the same size and the same, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but the prices were so drastically different. When you're Looking at expenses of storage, just really quickly, you'll have your general taxes, insurance, payroll. This is for your on-site manager. Off-site management is what you'll pay for your third-party group that manages them. We talked about Uncle Bob's or Extra Space or somebody local. Uh, or they could be yourself. This is what you pay yourself for managing your manager. I've seen that as well. Utilities, phone, gas, trash, electric. Software, storage software typically pays on a monthly license, so um, you need the budget for that. Credit card and bank fees will be in there. Office supplies, you're going to be printing out leases on printers and stuff, so you'll go through some ink and toner and stamps. Maintenance and repair, it's amazing how many I look at. Uh, Self-storage deals I look at for the seller has nothing budgeted for maintenance and repair for the buyer. Um, it needs to be in there. Locks and uh, latches and springs and all that stuff eventually breaks and needs to be replaced and if your gate doesn't open for your customer you're gonna pay five hundred dollars to have the gate guy come fix it for you so snow and lawn removal advertising for websites yellow pages was really big you know five ten years ago it's not so much anymore most advertising is spent on the internet for Google ad spend and search engine optimization things like that uh, there's typically two types of self-storage deals that are uh, listed or are available. There's your turnkey facility and your turnaround facility, and we have two basic case studies on each one. The turnkey facility is your Class A or B property. There's little to no deferred maintenance. There's minimal work required. Uh, you're typically going to pay a lower cap rate and a higher price because you tend to have less risk. Um, your real estate investment trusts are attracted to these, and especially in the large urban markets, because uh, they are competing against each other to buy them. And these are typically very easy to finance. Banks like these because they're very consistent and they, they turn out good income. There's not a lot of surprises. The turnaround facility is your Class B or Class C facility. Typically, it's plagued by low occupancy, poor management, or no management. Uh, there's significant deferred maintenance. Um, high upside is achieved though if you solve a lot of the problems. One of the big things that you see with these turnaround facilities is the seller keeps really terrible books and so and they don't have any management software so you don't really know what it's actually doing. You have to dig down in the files and walk the property and, and read the leases to truly understand what's going on and it takes a lot of time. For Case study, this is a deal I actually brokered uh, in my Kansas City market. It was 34,000 square feet, 227 units. It was built in 1998. It had very stable occupancy at 80%. It was like clockwork. That's what it did uh, for five previous years. That was always around that occupancy. The seller was motivated. He had things that happened and he needed to sell. There was no website. He was not open on Saturdays, and he never really raised rents because he just felt like he didn't need to. So it's a very clean deal, and someone could turn around and buy this, which uh, my client did. He bought this using SBA 504 financing, and he kept the existing management in place. He invested in a new website and did some search engine optimization marketing. 
he did establish new Saturday hours. If you think about it, when's the time that most people have to move into a storage unit? It's probably on the weekend. And so Saturday hours. And after six months, he sent a letter out saying, hey, expenses have gone up these last seven years. I'm going to raise my rents. And not a single tenant complained. And as a result of his effort, which really was not much, opening on Saturday and sending out a letter, um, his occupancy is usually around 90%. And his the value increased on that has been approximately $300,000 over what he paid for the property. So it's a really cool deal. Case study number two, let's contrast that on the difference between these two. Uh, this is another uh, self-storage facility that I brokered. Built in 1996, it was 80,000 square feet, 350 units, and this 350 was all in this. It wasn't any of the parking. The seller was distressed, and I think he and his bank were no longer on speaking terms. The management was very poor. They had no management software. They had very poor record keeping. There was multiple abandoned vehicles on site. Uh, it had a poor reputation in the market because people were getting their stuff stolen and units were being broken into because there wasn't any fence and the gate was broken. Uh, there were a lot of gaps in security and things like that. They came in, they bought the property, and they've been, they immediately replaced the management. They installed some storage software. They implemented security measures with fixing the uh, front gate and the security surveillance system. They added a fence around the property. They put a new digital signage, which gave it a great uh, face to the community. And they systematically have gone unit by unit and fixed all the broken latches and springs and all the little things that added up. They've been um, tackling item by item. And they've done a great job. And occupancy, when they bought it, it was 55%. And it's been uh, trending up every month. And when it's stabilized at like 80 to 85%, it will be worth anywhere between a million to a million and a half more than they paid for it. So um, it's going to take them time. It's not something that can happen in two months, but in three years, over time and effort of fixing a bunch of things, uh, there's some real profit in this property. So that's a that's a turnaround deal. This one is a little bit harder to finance because p potentially the cash flow wasn't there initially, and they had to spend some money in to investing in the in the property. So that's the difference between your turnkey property and your turnaround property.